Hello and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, all of you, and uh, welcome to this uh, to our regular webinars now. Um, to will I'm seeing that there's still uh, many people coming in, so uh, I'll take those uh, introductory words uh, first. To uh, well, to first thank you uh, indeed for uh, attending this webinar uh, as a point of order of uh, you know, housekeeping. Uh, during the presentation, don't hesitate. You can uh, either to all or pri in private send your questions, we, which we will uh, address or Jean will address uh, at the end of his presentation. Um, and uh, well, it not let, let's not waste too much time here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jean René, who's uh, an environmental engineer who studied in uh, Lille, uh, who I know very well, has been uh, uh, now has been has quite a bit of experience now uh, in uh, thermal desorption. Has also worked in several other technologies, but mainly in thermal desorption. And um, he's a project engineer at Hamer's Technologies, uh, in charge uh, of uh, quite a substantial number of projects right now uh, running in France. And um, he chose to uh, prepare a pretty nice uh, subject today, which uh, which is. Uh, revise or uh, renew the new burners on the, or the I see there is a uh, something is everybody hearing well or okay I think that's done. Um, he will he will talk about what we call remote flame. So essentially how can we heat up soil that is not contaminated from the surface but that can be contaminated just starting at a certain depth and how does that work? What are the issues with that, especially since we work with gas burners, and it's not an obvious uh, topic. Um, before we, before I leave the floor to Jean, uh, this presentation is recorded. You will get a, 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 an access and a copy of the recording after the, the webinar. So uh, don't worry, uh, you don't have to register or to register it yourself or record it yourself. Um, again, questions. Do it on the chat box, direct or indirect. Uh, we'll address it at the end of the presentation. And uh, uh, let's waste no time, Jean. Uh, the floor is yours. I'll uh, leave it up to you. And here is the presentation. OK, thank you, Jan. So thank you, everybody, for your participation uh, to the webinar. So as Jan said, I will talk uh, about the development that Amherst Technologies did uh, the last few years uh, for one of the the technology that we developed, which is the remote flame burner. So, so first of all, uh, there will be a company overview. Then I will talk about the technology principle of the remote flame burner uh, that I will just with some case studies and then a little conclusion. Now. Uh, so Amherst Technologies is a Belgium-based company uh, with their headquarters in uh, Brussels. So we provide remediation technologies all over the world since more than 25 years now. And in order to be standalone, we have our own smart burners uh, manufacturing facilities. And we also uh, invested in our own uh, lab and uh, research and development uh, facilities. So it helps us to develop new products and new technologies uh, like the one that I will present today. So uh, here are some names of some companies that uh, trusted us. So you might recognize, for example, uh, ExxonMobil or Total or um, some companies like Acom or Golda. So we had some operation all over the world with local partners. So we mainly developed uh, ISTD, which is uh, Institute Thermal Desorption. So mainly ISTD was done uh, in Europe and a little bit uh, over Asia, like in Singapore. So there are uh, the blue spots. You also can see on this map uh, orange and um, red spots that are uh, ESTD. So exit to thermal disruption or thermobile uh, that were done uh, either in France or in China or even in Greenland. Um, we also developed rotary kiln, uh, all the green uh, dots, um, but we used rotary kiln until 2006 and now we decided to stop this method. 
So now I will talk a bit about the technology principle. <coughs> so as you might know, Amos Technologies is specialized in uh, thermal desorption, but what does that mean? So thermal desorption is a physical, uh, a physical chemical technique that is used to mainly vaporize pollutants through uh, the heating of the cell temperature. So how do we do that? So first of all, we basically create flame uh, here. You can see the flame. So we basically create flame uh, um, that is conducted through the pipes, so through the two coaxial pipes. And uh, the, while the flame is created, uh, it is uh, created. So the heat will be conducted through those two coaxial pipes and it will hit the ground by um, conduction. So once the ground uh, gets to the vaporized um, to the vaporized temperatures of the organic pollutants that we want to remediate, the um, pollutants get uh, vaporized, so it's under vapor phase. And uh, how to get the vapors? We will have to create a depression into the soil in order to get all those vapors getting into the vapor tubes that are screened. And then we collect all the vapors and we need to treat them. Uh, I will not talk about the treatment uh, of the vapors because it's a big subject, but maybe we will have another webinar about uh, that uh, topic. So what are our what is our ethic system? So mainly we uh, depollute uh, pollution from zero meter below ground level. So we have uh, homogeneous heating. So it can either be vertical uh, with in-situ thermal desorption uh, with the pipes placed uh, vertically. So there is a mistake, sorry. Sorry for that. Um, it can either be uh, ex-situ thermal desorption with horizontal tubes. So the flame is generated and uh, uh, all the heat goes uh, horizontally. And we also can get uh, pollution under buildings with oblique pipes. But now I will take a little case study. What if the pollution is not uh, is not um, is not located from zero meter below ground level? What, for example, if the pollution is at like twenty meters, like you can see on the on the on this sham? As you can see here, the pollution is pretty deep, but it does not start start from the beginning of the ground. So um, we can use uh, classic uh, in-situ thermal disruption burners. So with this technology, we can eat all the ground in order to remove the pollution plume uh, that is very deep. But the efficiency of the system, the eating efficiency will not be so good. So the perfect way would be to only eat the pollution plume. But how to do that? <coughs> we need to create some burners that can only create a flame uh, at the pollution level uh, so that you can see here. So we place some tubes as in the classic uh, ISTD, but the flame is created just here and uh, it is locally, uh, is, is just, uh, the soil is heated just at the pollution plume, sorry. <coughs> we also, uh, with this technology, can treat, uh, cool treat, uh, low nipple. Um, so here you have a pollution on the groundwater. Here you can see that is only on the groundwater, uh, at the groundwater level. And here we can apply uh, in-situ thermal disruption with remote burner, remote flame burner, in order to treat only the uh, this uh, low nipple pollution. So, but now, how to do that, how to create the flame <coughs> at this, this pollution level. So we developed this burner. So the flame is still generated by the combustion head, but the flame is not uh, generated anymore uh, over the ground. The flame is generated <coughs> at the pollution level. Um, <coughs> so how to get uh, the combustion head at uh, the pollution level. That is what I'm going to talk about. So there was a lot of uh, engineering challenges about that. So how to get 
all those pipes and all those wires uh, into the soil at this depth, like at 20 meters. So the first uh, challenge was the flame temperature. As you might know, uh, the flame that we create is at uh, almost 1200 degrees and the pipes that we use are in steel. So steel only can resist about 600 to 800, depends if it's uh, stainless or classic steel. Um, so with a flame of 1200 uh, degrees, you might understand that it will just melt and the pipes will be damaged. So with classical uh, ISTD, we use a burner body. So here, you can see it here. And we protect the steel with refractory cement. So the refractory cement is placed uh, on the, under the burner body in order and at the flame uh, level in order to protect the steel pipe. So now how to get uh, this refractory cement into the soil because now uh, with the remote flame, the um, the combustion head is very, very deep, like at 20 meters. So <laughs> we have decided to place a piece of internal pipe with refractory cement at the flame level. So here you can see on this um, on this shim, um, the combustion head is here, for example, at 20 meters. Uh, and the refractory cement is just placed uh, under the combustion head so that the flame is created and the steel can resist to the to the heat. So now that I talked about this first challenge, uh, I will talk about the second challenge because how to get the fuel to the combustion head? How can we can we fuel this combustion head? Because with no fuel, we cannot have a flame. So with classic uh, ISTD, the combustion head is usually placed outside the ground in the body burner. So here, <clears throat> um, the combustion head is directly fueled by the gas through the control box. So here in yellow, you can see the fuel network that goes into the control box and the control box dist distributes uh, and fuel the combustion head that is placed uh, around here. But how to get uh, with remote flame burner the, the um, gas at 20 meters? <clears throat> so mainly we decided to simply connect um, um, our finch steel pipe to the control box, so to this part of the burner. And uh, this steel pipe is going through the internal pipe to connect to the combustion head. <clears throat> so that we can fuel the combustion head with uh, gas. And this pipe will also support, we also have the role of supporting the combustion head in order to prevent uh, the combustion head to fall uh, into the internal pipes and then we cannot uh, remediate anymore, so it's, it's a problem. Then I will talk about a third problem, a third challenge, so how to avoid cross-contamination because <clears throat> like for example, the 21st meter will not be contaminated and then we are eating uh, from 20 to 30 meters. How to avoid the vapors to the vapors to get to the not contaminated uh, area zone. <clears throat> so on a classic ISTD vapors tube, are screened from the vape, uh, from the beginning of the pipe. So it means on a classic ISTD, from zero meter below ground level, we have screened uh, vapor tubes so the so that the vapors can get into directly into the into the vapor tubes. Uh, we cannot do that in uh, our case because if we do that, uh, the vapors would get from the polluted uh, area to, uh, for example, one meter uh, below ground level and would pollute the not polluted uh, area. So we decided to uh, to screen, to only screen the vapor tubes uh, at the pollution level. So here you can see the, the two, two examples. Um, so on this vapor tube, uh, the screening uh, starts about 19 meters and on this vapor tube, the screening starts uh, at eight uh, meters. We also decided to, 
to seal over the vapor tubes. So here, uh, next to the vapor tubes, we usually place gravel in order for the vapors to get into the vapor tubes and also not to uh, block the vapor tubes uh, with um, soil. So in order to prevent the vapors coming here and uh, getting through the surface, we decided to use bentonets, bentonite or, um, or concrete in order to prevent uh, that uh, cross-contamination. <coughs> There was also another last uh, last challenge. So it was to supply electricity to the combustion head within a uh, hot internal tube. Uh, and as you can know, um, electric wires does not like uh, uh, it, so it does not match. But I won't talk about it because it's a bit too technical and there are a bit too yeah too much informations. So now that uh, we, I talked about the technology and you know a bit more about the technology, I will <coughs> develop uh, how we implement it on the field. So I will develop with two uh, case studies. The first case studies is located uh, in Kent. So it's in the United Kingdom. Um, it was, it's, it's a um, case studies that a remediation that we did with uh, Ecologia. That is another remediation company. Uh, it used to be a former chemical industry, and under the site, uh, so the, the chemical industry induced uh, uh, contamination uh, in benzene or in, trim, in, in trimethyl benzene. Um, and why did we need to remediate uh, this pollution? That is, you can see it's not very high uh, pollution, but we needed to remediate it because uh, because under the side, the groundwater table uh, was used to supply water to the city nearby. So, so they needed to have clean water. So um, we defined two different areas. So uh, on this site, we had a groundwater table that was pumped at 29 meters deep and the upper, so the pollution was divided in two different areas, one from 9 to 29 meters and one from 21.5 meters to 29 meters. So as you can see on the first meters of the soil, there is no pollution, so there is no need to, to eat this soil. <coughs> So here you can see an aerial picture of um, of, uh, of the site with all the strategies, the, of all the remediation strategies. So <coughs> what did we do? Um, so how, how did we do the remediation? So it was a synergy between Ecologia and Amherst Technologies, where Ecologia uh, took care of soil vapor injection and soil vapor um, extraction and as well uh, air injection and Amherst Technologies um, took care of thermal desorption as it's our core business. Uh, the treatment temperature was 90 degrees for 10 days. So we need we needed to reach 90 degrees, 90 degrees sorry, for 10 days. <clears throat> um, before uh, doing the design, we did some modeling in order to optimize it. Uh, so we do it with Fluent software that is also used by uh, the NASA or other companies or, or the big companies. And um, so here you can see that, uh, so we needed to reach 90 degrees. So here you can see a map of the uh, modelization, temp the, mo the temperature modelization after uh, 50 days of eating. So almost none of the site is uh, remediated. But after 100 days, with five uh, meters of interdistance between uh, each eating tube, uh, we could reach uh, at least 90 degrees. <coughs> so here you can see a map of the site with all the remediation strategies. So what are underlined uh, in yellow and in blue are the um, eating tubes. <coughs> So we decided to place 16 eating tubes. However, we did not decide to place them and to, to eat like from uh, 9 to 29 uh, meters for each because the pollution plume was different in uh, many parts of the, of the site. So here you can see a map, a modelization of the pollution uh, on the site. 
So here you can see uh, on the mark C and D that the pollution starts at nine meters. And here you can see uh, C and D, it's about here, that we decided to place heating tube to 29 meters, but heating from nine meters to 29 meters. So <coughs> for the other part of the site, we decided only to eat to, uh, from uh, 21.5 to 29 meters because the the other the the, the shallow uh, ground was not impacted, so we did not have to eat the soil. <coughs> so it was a site adapted design. So it uh, it permit to it allowed us to make a, to decrease a lot the heated uh, soil volume and also we decreased a lot the heat, heat losses <laughs> so it made a lot of uh, energy saving so as you can see here it's a table where i show uh, how we the, the number of uh, cubic meter that we remediate with remote flame and how much we had to remediate if we did not use uh, remote flame. So the gain was about 77%. Uh, so it made a huge energy consumption uh, gain. So as you can see here with remote flame, we consume that much. Uh, if we had to use, if we used classic ISTD, it would have uh, consumed that much <coughs> without uh, the, the need of consuming that much. So why we used also a remote flame? Because we also had uh, no concrete to put on the soil, so it's another gain uh, compared to classic ISTD. <coughs> the soil, uh, the soil, the not contaminated uh, soil over the contaminated soil uh, is a very is, is an insulating material, so we don't need to use concrete anymore. Uh, on this site, it was impossible to excavate because there are a lot of buildings. Uh, in uh, nearby, <clears throat> the surface was not impacted. The building nearby were not uh, affected as well, and we could treat uh, with a site-specific uh, 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 design uh, deep contamination. So now that I talked about um, Kent, I will talk about a f um, site in France. Um, in the city of Luciana, so it's in Corsica. I don't know if you know Corsica. It's, it's a nice island. You should you should go. There are a lot, not, a lot of nice beaches, but <clears throat> that's not what I will talk about uh, now. Um, so we did the remediation with Englob, that is another remediation company uh, uh, of France. <clears throat> uh, it used to be a former um, electric. Uh, which is a big company of friends uh, there was there, there is a, a contamination in the volatile components and the site was um, divided in two parts so the north area <coughs> which was uh, contaminated uh, we are, which had a low contamin contamination sorry and the south area, which had a very huge contamination. So I will only talk now about the south, the south area. So we also had a deep pollution. Um, the pollution was from 5 to 13 meters. Uh, and the groundwater table was pumped at uh, uh, 15 meters. We knew that the first 5 meters were not impacted at all because uh, this soil was um, brought to the site by um, another remediation company after other uh, remediation works. So we knew that this uh, soil was not impacted and also it was really compacted. So um, EDF did not want uh, this soil to be removed. <clears throat> so here you can see a picture of the site. Uh, we also had a vapor treatment unit because it was volatile components that we could not uh, could not treat uh, with ribbon. So, 
So the remediation, uh, the collabor the synergy with uh, Englobe was they were taking care of uh, the venting and the groundwater pumping, and Amherst Technologies was taking care of thermal desorption. Uh, on this site, the temperature target was uh, 85 degrees for five days. Uh, we also did a modelization. So here you can see a modelization of the heating of the heating of the site. So you can see that with the inter distance that we chose uh, three uh, of 3.5 uh, meters, uh, we cooled in 70 days, uh, reached the 90, the, the 80 five degrees of target temperature. So as I uh, as I told you, we choose to have an interdistance of 3.5 meters and to place um, 51 um, burners into the into this site. So here you can see a map of the repartition of the of the burner. So in in red, I don't know if you can see, but in red um, in red you have the heating tubes. And in yellow, you uh, in yellow or in orange, you have the thermocouple tubes. So the thermocouple thermocouple tubes are placed in, at the cold point, and they are allow us to monitor the um, to monitor the the cold point the cold points temperature. So to monitor the um, the heating of the soil. So here you can see that the the flame is generated at six meters. So you have the pipe. Um, so you have the pipe at six meters. You have the flame that is generated and the refractory concrete in order to to protect the internal pipe. So on this case, we also had a lot of energy saving. So we could have remediate. Uh, we could have it uh, almost uh, five thousand two hundred uh, cubic meters, but instead we decided to use the remote flame. So we only uh, eated three uh, three thousand two hundred um, cubic meter. So it was a gain of almost sixty one percent. And here is the gas consumption, the energy consumption uh, for the batch. So if uh, we use remote flame, and if we don't, if we don't use remote flame, so it's another time a great uh, energy consumption save. So, as you might know, uh, why we used uh, remote flame um, in Corsica, there is no landfill, so you cannot excavate and place the um, the soil into landfills. And if you want to, so the excavation is almost not possible. Uh, but if you want to excavate, uh, it will create a lot of uh, disturbances. Like uh, you will excavate, then you will place all the soil into trucks. The trucks will get to the boats, and the boats will get to France. So it's a it's a lot of disturbances, a lot of emissions. So the client decided to choose for him the best, the best sustainable uh, strategies. So which which was a uh, ISTD with remote flame, um, and with this strategy we could uh, remediate the deep contamination. So from five to thirteen meters deep. So what it's bringing me to the to the to this circularity um, system. So as you might know, like um, there is a first system that is more linear. So you can see here. So first this pole, then all excavate. So it's not very circular. But what is circular is uh, on-site treatment. This is the level two, or in situ treatment. This is the last level of circularity. So then you can have the primary use directly. <coughs> so to conclude, <coughs> um, the remote flame burners uh, allow us to target uh, deep pollution. It helps. It can help in low nipple remediation. It decreases the soil heating volume, so it makes a lot of energy saving, and it creates very low disturbances. Uh, so as I just showed you, ISTD in situ thermal disruption is like the level three of sustainability is one of the best uh, sustainable remediation technique as you don't have so much disturbances. And uh, here it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And now it's time for the question, I think.
Well, Jean, thank you very much. Uh, it's a really nice uh, overview of uh, what you guys have been doing in into the remote flames and two nice, uh, very nice uh, case studies. Uh, so great job. Okay. Let me go over what I already see here um, on, on a couple of questions. Uh, how do we manage to be sure that we always pump the vapors from the contaminated layers? How, how do we do that? OK, yeah. Uh, how do we do that? I explained a bit. So how we'll can we make sure? Oh, how can we make sure? Because that's the question. Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes. So how do, uh, how do we make sure? So as I told you, um, the soil always need to be uh, under pressure. Um, so in order to get the soil under, under pressure, negative pressure, yeah, 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 we put the negative pressures thanks to like blowers. So this soil always has to be under negative pressure. Then the vapor tubes can suck all the vapors. Um, so if we have a, a blower failure, for example, we'll always have another blower in, to replace it very, very fast. Uh, and we also have, for example, if uh, we have a um, uh, power failure, we will use another strategy to get power. Uh, so we always have under pressure uh, into the soil. So we there is no possibility that the vapors can get to the not polluted area. Okay, so it's important indeed to keep the, that. That's the vapor control, I guess. It's really to make sure that everything is always under negative pressure so that the only way to go is towards the, the vapor tubes. Um, how do you assure that there is no fuel leakage inside the internal tube? OK, yeah. Um, how do we make sure? Um, first of all, we use a lot of techniques to be sure, like we use um, we use a gas specific product in order to um, to to get the pipe very well tight. So then we know normally that there is no there are no leakages. Then we test before uh, putting the combustion head uh, into the soil. We can test all the system. And either if there is a little leakage, uh, you have to know that the um, the pressure, uh, the, the the gas pressure is like minimum that for less than 20 millibars. So it will be a very little leakage. And this leakage uh, would be as all the system is under pressure, the, the, the leakage or the gas will go to the combustion head and the gas will be ignited uh, and it will create the flame as well. So there is no problem with this leakage. Uh, there, there, there is no issue. Yeah, but you confirmed before you start, there's always an external control yeah. of uh, yeah, integrity. Yeah. Uh, then did you uh, did you do any soil sampling uh, proving the clean soil above the target zone is actually clean? Yeah, um, on the, the second case that I, I told you about, <coughs> uh, we knew that the soil was clean because this soil was um, was brought to the site by another company, so we had we had some um, some uh, soil sampling to prove that, and we also asked the client to do other soil sampling for us to be sure that uh, before that we start the treatment that the soil is not polluted. So yes, we always take uh, soil sampling before starting the system. Okay. Could it be used horizontally? It also can be used horizontally. Yeah, <clears throat> that's uh, that's something that uh, we are going to develop in the in the next months, uh, because uh, nowadays on ex situ thermal desorption, the flame is also created uh, outside the ground, so on the body burner. Uh, and as you might know, the body burner creates some uh, heat losses. So we decided that it was smarter to create the flame inside the the pile, uh, so we don't get uh, the losses uh, into the body the body burner, and we get the flame at one meter horizontally uh, into the um, into the the pile. So yes, it can be used uh, and it will be used uh, in the future uh, in exit thermal desorption. Yeah. So, but that's. That also answered, by the way, the next question in in um, using the system, even if your pollution starts from the 
from the highest level or from the from the ground level, um, whether it's horizontally in ESTD. Um, we we used this. We did a project years ago uh, where we tried the first version of this uh, remote flame horizontally to uh, in exactly have the same idea to heat up under an existing building, but from the other side of the road and not heating the first eight or nine meters because we couldn't heat all the um, pipes and and uh, um, sewers and and also the asphalt with. We, and, and it was clean, so it did, that did need so. But that so th these are two things. You could use it horizontally, just to to reach the the target treatment zone from a farther point, because there is a, an area that doesn't need treatment, and it could be inclined, I guess. And then the the other one is even if it's not polluted from the surface, which was then the next question, you could still use it because it's more energy efficient. So that that that's a that's an important thing as you as you mentioned you you save all the radiating losses at at, at the surface which you don't have anymore and that thinks that explains why this uh, this is much more uh, energy efficient than, uh, as the previous version next question what about soil sampling of topsoil which is clean after the cleanup if it is still clean and have not been cross contaminated so uh, here the, the, the question is, we have seen issues with pressure control when using reburn, but I assume reburn is not used for deep flame. So maybe th th there are two things here. There's the one on the on verifying sampling after treatment that there indeed the vapors have been contained and not and not migrated upwards and then condensed. So that's one question uh, which you partly addressed, but it, it might be good to uh, to to um, to address that, and then the second part of the question is then uh, reburn. Can reburn be applied? So as I as I told you, uh, yes. Well, I, I will answer directly to the second question, but yes, we also can use a uh, reburn uh, on this technique. Um, it was it it should have been the case uh, for the Kent case studies, but we found out that there was some uh, mercury inside the ground that so we could not use ribbon but yes that's something that we can do and for for the shallow uh, area that is not contaminated as i told you um we just need to keep the pressure underneath the zero bar uh, then all the vapors get into the vapor tubes and do not pollute the the not contaminated area and after the treatment we also can take um soil samples uh, in of this not contaminated area, but we did not have uh, any cases of cross contamination for now. <laughs> OK, maybe let me add two things on the reburn. Uh, this this uh, uh, those two cases have no reburn, but there is one that is starting as we speak, I think this week or next week uh, where there is reburn. So uh, it's it, it's it's the the goal to do it again. Reburn has double benefit. It will reduce fuel consumption because we reuse the energy in there, and most and foremost, it will uh, create zero waste because you don't have, of course, the carbon or anything other other uh, residues. Um, so that's one. And then the second part, just to add, to answer the first part of the question, to add on onto that, yes, when you have a covering layer, the risk is. Uh, migration up and, and condensation hence the the, the 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 continuity of extraction make sure that the blower is always there so you have a backup for that and there is a generator in case of a of an electrical shutdown it continues to to attract and, and to keep everything under negative air but also very important is to note where the difference in permeability and humidity is and temperature the the, the top part it has lower permeability, has of course more moisture. So the natural, the 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 the, the vapors will have to move from a high temperature, high permeability uh, volume, porous media, into a lower permeability and colder one. That doesn't happen. The only reason why it would happen if that if there is nothing going on, then it would naturally migrate up, and it will then condense probably in the first meter and take on whatever uh, available uh, pores there are. But it, it is important to know that 
the, the, the natural migration is, is reversed. It naturally goes from the uh, low temperature, high moisture part into the 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 low uh, the high permeability and high temperature part. That's the, that's where capillarity will go, and that's exactly what we're trying to uh, to encourage by having the vapor extraction pipes next to the heating elements, so that there is it, it always goes from a low permeability to a high permeability. So we encourage, and we we the the the, the forced system is also the natural system. The only point is shutting down. You will all it will always go up, and so. Just capping it mechanically is never enough. There will be condensation if there is a shutdown. Um, I let me see. I think that there is a uh, the last question I see here in the in the list. How do you know that the heating pipes are at the required temperature? Yes. Okay. It's true. That I I haven't talked about that um, on my presentation, but um, in order to know. If the heating pipe uh, is at the good temperature, we place uh, thermocouples uh, all over the pipe. So we place like, for example, if the pipe is need to go at 29 degrees, for example, like in the Kent, we place five thermocouples, like one at nine meters, one at 15 meters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to see if the um, the heat repartition the is if the heating of the pipe is homogeneous, then it uh, allows us to know uh, if we have the good uh, mixing of air inside the pipe, if we have a perfect combustion as well. So yes, this monitoring uh, this monitoring aspect is very important uh, in the in the treatment as we know that we need to get the burners to like for example 400 degrees it's very important to monitor and to be sure that at nine meters the temperature is the same that as uh, at uh, 20 or 29 meters so yeah thanks for the question all right well thanks for the answer um i don't see any more questions don't hesitate if you have some more you can still uh add them on and we'll we'll take care of them as we usually do um well i think we're uh, almost on time let rest to me to first and foremost thank uh jean for this uh, uh nice uh, presentation uh, good effort i think it was pretty clear and focused uh, congratulations to you and thank you very much thank you to all of you for attending uh this webinar uh looking forward to get you on on the next ones and on the whole series uh so rest me to wish you a very good day very good evening wherever you are and uh see you next time bye 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 thank you